Welcome, I am James Snap Jr. In today's lecture, we are going to look into the Eusebian Canons. The most important feature of any New Testament manuscript is its text. The second most important feature is its metatext, the materials that accompany, arrange, and supplement the text. The metatext, or what Larry Hurtado has called the metadata, can consist of many things, such as the arrangement of the text, chapter titles, notes accompanying the text, and features related to the lectionary. The history of the transmission of the text of the New Testament cannot be accurately and completely written without involving the history of the transmission of the metatext. The Eusebian canons are a metatextual feature found in many manuscripts. We're used to using the term canon to refer to the standard collection of authoritative books in the Bible. The Eusebian canons are something else. They are not a list of books. They are basically lists of parallel passages in the four Gospels. Before we can understand the Eusebian canons and sections, another subject must be introduced. Greek numerals. An entire lecture could be devoted to this, but today we will just cover the basics. In ancient Greek, the letters of the alphabet were used as numerals. There were different ways to signify that the reader was supposed to interpret a letter or a group of letters as a numeral. Usually, when dealing with numerals less than a thousand, the numerals are overlined. To represent all possible amounts between 1 and 999, 27 numerals are required. The Greek alphabet contains 24 letters, so three obsolete letters were used to complete the array of 9 ones, 9 tens, and 9 hundreds. Let's consider some examples of how this worked. The numeral 12 consists of iota alongside beta. 10 plus 2 is 12. 318, whoops, excuse me. Yeah, there we go. 318 is written as 300 plus 10 plus 8. 276, 200 plus 70 plus 6. For 450, only two uh, letters are needed. Uh, upsilon is 400, and u is, is 50. 666 is not three sixes, it's 660 and 6. Uh, here we use the, the digamma, and here we use the style or stigma, but it's, they're, they're both 6. Also, the letter mu could be used to represent 10,000, that is, a myriad. But the number of 10,000s was then placed above the mu. mu. Now let's return to our main subject. In manuscripts of the Gospels, before the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, one often finds a letter and a series of charts. The charts are the Eusebian canons. They provide the reader with the means to cross-reference parallel passages or thematically similar passages of the Gospels. The letter is known as Ad Carpianus, or Ad Tu Carpian. We don't know exactly who Carpian was, and it does not really matter. The author of the letter was Eusebius of Caesarea, an influential bishop in the early 300s who had a very in interesting career, which we will not explore today. Eusebius' letter to Carpian explains what the Eusebian canons are for and how to use them. The Greek text of Eusebius' letter to Carpian can be found in, in Nestle Island, between the introduction and the beginning of Matthew. Mark de Cagliano has helpfully provided an English translation of Eusebius' letter, which can be accessed online as a public domain publication at Roger Pierce's Tertullian.org website. With some paraphrasing and summarization, here is what Eusebius' letter says. Greetings from Eusebius to Carpian, his beloved brother in the Lord. Ammonius the Alexandrian, after exerting a great deal of energy and effort, has handed down to us a harmonized account of the four Gospels. Alongside the Gospel of Matthew, he placed the corresponding sections of the other three Gospels. But this had the inevitable result of ruining their sequential order. Keeping both the body and the sequence of the Gospels completely intact, in order that you may be able to know where each evangelist wrote passages in which they were led by love of truth to speak about the same things, I have drawn up a total of ten tables according to another system, 
using the raw data from Ammonius. These tables are set up for you below. The first of them lists the section numbers in which similar things are reported in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The second table lists the section numbers in which similar things are reported in the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The third table lists the section numbers in which similar things are reported by Matthew, Luke, and John. The fourth table lists the section numbers in which similar things are reported by Matthew, Mark, and John. The fifth table lists the section numbers in which similar things are reported in the two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. The sixth, likewise, by Matthew and Mark. The seventh, likewise, by Matthew and John. The eighth, likewise, by Mark and Luke. The ninth, likewise, by Luke and John. And the tenth is for unique things reported in each Gospel. Now that I have outlined the structure of the tables, I will explain how to use them. In each of the four Gospels, a consecutive number is assigned to each section, starting from the first, and then the second, and the third, and so on, proceeding through the whole Gospel to the end of the book. Every section number has a numeral written below it in red, indicating in which of the ten tables the section number can be found. If the red numeral is a one, the section number is in the first table. And if it's a 2, the section number is in the second table, and so forth to the numeral 10. So suppose you open one of the four Gospels at some point, and you want to know what Gospels report some of the things, and where to find the passages in which they speak about the same things. By using the number assigned for the section in which you're interested, and looking for it within the table indicated by the red numeral below it, you will immediately discover from the titles how many Gospels and which Gospels report similar things. By going to the other gospel section numbers in the same row as the section number in the table you are at, and looking them up in each gospel, you will find similar things mentioned. And after those instructions, the canon tables are presented. Sometimes they are plain, no-nonsense lists. The names of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are often abbreviated. Now, this is what the Greek abbreviations for each gospel's name usually looks like. Usually look like. In some medieval Latin and Armenian copies, artists decorated the charts in elaborate detail. A little portrait of Eusebius is sometimes included. Uh, some Armenian copies even include a portrait of Carpian. Occasionally, the letter to Carpian is written in a cruciform format. Sometimes the letter is written inside a quatrefoil. The letter to Carpian may be written in an older style of lettering. Than, than the style of script used for the text of the Gospels. In deluxe manuscripts, it's not unusual to see decorations in the Eusebian canons in which the symbols for the evangelists are used. Matthew is Matthew is the man, uh, Mark is the lion, Luke is the ox, and John is the eagle. At least, that's what they usually are. The canon tables are often framed by columns on each side with an arch above them. Sometimes instead of arches, such as we see here, there's a roof. These features seem intended to convey that as the reader approaches the Gospels, the reader is spiritually entering a temple, or a cathedral, or a royal palace. The devout reader is about to encounter the Word of God. Sometimes there are birds or animals or flowers or fountains or pictures or grape clusters above or around the arches. Uh, some of the paint used in these decorations enhance the physical value of the manuscript. Lapis lazuli was sometimes used to make the blue color. The Eusebian canons take up several pages. If they achieved nothing else, we would be glad they exist because they protected the opening pages of the Gospel of Matthew in many copies. But they do achieve something else. Uh, they do what Eusebius designed them to do. They provide a cross-reference system for the four Gospels. Now, in order for Eusebius' cross-reference system to work, the correct section numbers and canon numbers need to be placed alongside each section throughout the text of all four Gospels. And if you have a, a Nussel Allen text, you can find these section numbers and canon numbers in the inner margin of the text of the Gospels. Uh, chapter numbers are there, too, in italics. 
But not all manuscripts contain exactly the same form of the Eusebian canons. For instance, in some manuscripts, excuse me, for example, annotations in the family one group of manuscripts state that Eusebius did not include Mark 16, 9 through 20 in his canons. Uh, in some manuscripts, the section numbers accordingly stop at number 233, and no section numbers accompany the contents of Mark 16, 9 through 20. But in the vast majority of manuscripts, even in some manuscripts that are members of family one, additional section numbers were supplied for sections of Mark 16, 9 through 20. So the last section number is between 234 and 241. Variations in the Eusebian sections also occur at Matthew 16, 2 through 3, at Mark 15, 28, at Luke 22, 43 through 44, and at Luke 23, 34. And these are just major variations, there are lots of smaller ones. Uh, at these places, some manuscripts have verses that other manuscripts don't have, and the canon numbers and section numbers have been adjusted accordingly. So in some cases, even if we don't have the page of a manuscript that contained a passage where a large variant occurs, we can make a calculated guess about whether or not the manuscript had that variant if the variant reading was large enough to form a Eusebian section, and if we can read the Eusebian canons from that manuscript. When making that kind of deduction, though, one needs to keep in mind the possibility that when the manuscript was produced, one example was used when a copyist wrote the text, and a diff different example was used when a copyist wrote the Eusebian canons and section numbers. Those two examples might echo two different forms of text. It's interesting to note that the lack of a separate section number for Matthew 27 and 49 tells us something about the text that Eusebius used when he prepared his canons. His text did not contain the extra material about the spear piercing that is included in Matthew 27 49 in Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. If Eusebius' text had included that material, it would have been assigned its own section number and it would have been placed in Canon 7, which contains parallels found in Matthew and John, alongside the section number of the passage in John that contains John 1934. This implies that Eusebius used a text that did not contain the extra material in Matthew 27 49. That is, Eusebius did not use a text of Matthew that was like the text of Matthew found in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. A question has been raised about whether the section numbers should be called the Ammonian sections or the Eusebian sections. In the 1800s and early 1900s, uh, the term Ammonian section was used, and that name has stuck, but it, con it conveys an impression that has proven to be false. Ammonius's Matthew-centered cross-reference system served as Eusebius' inspiration, but the section numbers as we know them today were made by Eusebius, not by Ammonius. In 1871, John Bergen demonstrated that Eusebius, not Ammonius, created the Ammonian sections. Bergen pointed out that John 21, 12 through 13 is divided into three sections, and John 21, 15 through 17 is divided into six sections, and these divisions are not accounted for by a Matthew-centered arrangement. They only become sensible when one observes that these small sections were placed in Canons 9 and 10. As further proof, Bergen observed that according to Eusebius, the Gospel of Mark has 21 unique sections, Luke has 72 unique sections, and John has 97 unique sections. 14 sections are found in only Mark and Luke, and 21 sections are found in only Luke and John, so the Ammonian sections include 225 sections that could not be represented in Ammonius's Matthew-centered cross-reference system. Uh, Bergen explained, those 225 sections can have found no place in the work of Ammonius. And if, in some unexplained way, room was found for those parts of the Gospels, with what possible motive can Ammonius have subdivided them into exactly 225 portions? It is nothing else but irrational to assume that he did so. Researchers have noticed that some manuscripts have the section numbers in the margins alongside the text, but do not have the canon charts themselves. Why would anyone make such a manuscript? What good are the section numbers without the canon tables? In some cases, we might be looking at a manuscript that was never finished, or that was finished but with fewer features than the copyist had intended to include when the manuscript's production began. And in some cases, 
We might be looking at a damaged manuscript, possibly an intentionally damaged manuscript. The decorations of the Eusebian canons, especially when they were made with expensive pigments and gold paint, have tempted art collectors in the past to arrange the removal of the Eusebian canons from manuscripts so they could be kept as works of art. But in other cases, the section numbers were added not for their original purpose of indicating cross-references, but simply to help the reader locate where he was in the text. In other words, they served the same purpose that our modern chapter and verse numbers serve. Also, in some manuscripts, the canon tables are not absolutely required because parallel sections are listed, line by line, at the bottom of the page in what is called a foot harmony, like a footnote. The Greek uncial E has this feature. So does the Gothic Codex Argentius. Or Argentius. Uh, the foot harmony even has its own uh, arches and columns, it, its own arcades. Readers were thus given the contents of most of the canon tables a little at a time. Many Vulgate manuscripts and some Syriac manuscripts have canons and section numbers too. In Vulgate manuscripts, these numbers are based on an adjustment of Eusebius' work undertaken by Jerome. In manuscripts of the Peshitta that have the canon tables and section numbers, there are a lot more section divisions. The Syriac divisions represent a thorough improvement of Eusebius' work, conforming it to a different textual standard. Some Ethiopic Gospels manuscripts also have the canons and sections. In conclusion, I suggest that we should take the idea that common ancestry is indicated when the text of a small group of manuscripts has a collection of unique readings and apply that idea to the Eusebian canons. When copiers wrote the Eusebian canons and sections, they sometimes accidentally skipped a number or repeated the same number or assigned a section to the wrong canon are created variants in the canons and sections of one kind or another. It may be possible to identify and isolate distinct forms of the Eusebian canons. Uh, Reuben Swanson made a good start in that direction. In the many footnotes of the volumes from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament Greek Manuscript series. This might help establish the relationships of some manuscripts to other manuscripts in which the Eusebian canons share the same arrangements, or share other unusual features. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the Eusebian Canons. I'd like to express thanks to the British Library, the Auckland Libraries, and the Getty Museum for the use of their digital images. And thank you for watching.